this very last webinar for 2020, uh, which is part of a series on high impact research. And today's webinar is on conducting a literature review and how to get it published with Johan Runiel. Uh, we, by now, you all know what ANSYS is for and what it's trying to do. So we really hope that uh, these webinars and other initiatives are helping you to, to boost your research profile. And uh, today we focus more on something that uh, we've, we've all faced, that we've all had to do, which is to do a literature review. Um, but many of us maybe have faced the challenge of having to put the literature review into, on a shelf or in a drawer. And we, we want to learn how to make the most out of those literature reviews, um, get a nice paper out that gets lots of citations. And for, for that, we've, we've had to invite, uh, as, as usual, one of, one of the best. Uh, so today we have uh, Professor Johan Brunil. He is Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the ESSEC School of Management in France and in the same discipline at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And he has published extensively on social entrepreneurship and on hybrid organizations. So he's definitely part of our group and our network. So Johan, thank you very much for, for joining us and for availing yourself to, sh to share your expertise with us. And um, many, many of the attendants are PhD students, so I'm sure they'll, they'll benefit greatly and we will also benefit a lot. Uh, so as usual, before I hand it over to Johan, um, just remember that you are welcome to drop questions as we, as we go along. Um, Johan will also stop a couple of times to collect more, more questions. Um, we will we'll try our best to address all the questions uh, in the limited amount of time. But if we don't manage, uh, please forgive us if we, if we bundle your questions together or we, we just select uh, some of the more salient ones. So, Johan, you, we are very excited to hear um, what you have to say, and I hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, so a little bit more about my own background, so you know where I come from and uh, what I did in terms of research and what I'm currently doing. So actually I'm relatively new to the field of uh, social entrepreneurship and uh, hybrid organizations because originally I did my uh, PhD thesis on high-tech entrepreneurship, which is uh, arguably a different context than uh, social enterprises. And um, I looked at internationalization strategies of uh, high-tech firms. And it's actually through serendipity, which is of course an important concept in entrepreneurship uh, literature, that I accidentally arrived at uh, studying social, uh, social enterprises and uh, more broadly hybrid organizations. It was through a colleague of mine, a for former colleague of mine who, who left our research group on high-tech entrepreneurship. And, she wanted to do something completely different and chose social enterprises as an empirical context to start her own academic career as, a, as an assistant professor. And on a morning, she, she came to my office at the Ghent University at the time, asking whether I was interested in collaborating on a research project with her in the context of social enterprises. To be clear, at that point in time, I had zero affinity with social enterprises. The companies that I looked at were VC-backed companies that raised millions of euros from investors only to get 10 times their investment back after, after five to 10 years. So all these companies were very much economic value creation uh, oriented. But of course, being a little bit opportunistic, and I'm sure Philip can, uh, can acknowledge that, uh, I didn't say no to the opportunity. And while doing these research projects uh, together with this, uh, with this colleague, her name is, by the way, Natalie Moret, uh, I got more and more interested in, in, in social enterprises because, in my opinion, at the end of the day, these organizations are, from a um, researcher's perspective, e even more interesting than, for example, high-tech enterprises because they do not only need to be sustainable from an economic perspective, but they also have this clear, explicit ambition to do something uh, good for society, which sounds a little bit uh, soft, but to also create non-economic value for some, uh, for some groups of uh, beneficiaries. 
So um, that's a little bit about my own background. Uh, so I've been doing hybrid social entrepreneurship research for the last uh, five years. Um, but I'm not doing this all by myself, as you can imagine. Eh? Since everybody's here part of a network, you all appreciate the importance of collaborating with other colleagues. And so together with uh, Philip, my, together with Philip, um, we created a research group a year and a half ago uh, with Friedrich Dufay, which some people may know uh, as well, a research group at KU Leuven on hybrid, or, uh, on hybrid organizations. So basically today we are a group of 11 or 12 people uh, and we all have as a common denominator in terms of research interests, this context of orga organizations that have multiple objectives at the strategic uh, level. Um, you also see here the four different topics or themes that we, uh, that we are researching. So on the one hand, we look at the performance of these organizations. Uh, we look at the governance, apologies, at the governance of these organizations. Uh, this is my primary field of, um, of interest. Then we have Friedrich, who's primarily working on member participation. And this is specifically in the context of cooperatives. Yeah. Um, then we have performance, and performance is basically a theme that also speaks to the other three. And then finally, Philip is leading the research team on internationalization. So if there is anybody in the audience who wants to know more about our research group or who wants to get in contact with some of our uh, researchers, don't hesitate to drop me in now, to drop me an email. Um, but of course, I guess you guys are not coming to this webinar to hear me rambling about our research group and my prior uh, research experience. Uh, I understood that the team was conducting uh, a, literature, uh, a literature review. And um, I understood from the uh, conversation I had earlier with uh, Alex that you guys already had a session on how to develop interesting, uh, interesting research questions, as if there are un uninteresting uh, research questions. Uh, and then also a session on quantitative and qualitative research methods. I can imagine, and Alex told me that there were like on average like 40 to 50 attendees for each of these different sessions. Today I see there are only between brackets or between quotes only 22, because I thought personally that in, indeed literature reviews and conducting literature reviews is a little bit less sexy than, um, than talking about quantitative research and qualitative research. Having said that, okay, and being a good student of course, I developed a, a slide deck with some 35 slides. And basically I want to walk you through four different topics, four different elements related to the literature review as a, res as a research uh, method and as a, a, a fundamental building block of, of, of doing, a, doing a PhD. Um, so first what I will do is I will show that systematic literature reviews are similarly to quantitative research and qualitative research are a method. And if you do them properly, of course, putting emphasis on the word properly, then you should also be able to publish this. Unfortunately, what, I, what I've seen to date, based on my experience of working with PhD students and being on PhD committees, is that students typically approach this in, not through a systematic way, not, not, not based on a very tight uh, methodology, which basically makes the, the, the literature review useless from a, from a publication perspective. So I'll first show that, it's, that, it, that it needs to be based on a clear method. Um, then I will illustrate how this methodological approach towards doing a literature review um, works through a, a paper that I've published a couple of years ago together with a colleague who is now at the uh, Antwerp Management School with Robin. And the topic of the, of the systematic literature review is on entry modes and uh, SMEs. That would be the second part of my talk. Uh, then I suggest that we have a quick uh, Q&A section yeah, because this will be the first big part of my, uh, my discussion here this afternoon. And then after the Q&A on this uh, illustration, I will then present a work in progress uh, paper. And I need to emphasize here the word work in progress. So this is a project we've been 
working on for the last three to four months. Um, ah, I'm, 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 it's a little bit longer, uh, six months uh, together with a colleague at Jisek and at uh, Leuven, where we use a slightly adapted version of the systematic literature review in the sense that we approach it from a bibliometric uh, perspective. Uh, and then I will close my session with introducing and alluding to uh, an alternative approach to systematic literature reviews, which is the problematizing review. This is a nutshell what I prepared for you um, this afternoon. So to get started, let's first let's first introduce let's first introduce the systematic literature review as a as a method. And the best way of doing that is by comparing this with the literature review you typically do for developing the research question and building the arguments towards a research question in a conceptual or in an empirical, uh, in an empirical paper. They are fun fundamentally, uh, fundamentally different. What you do in a systematic literature review is you, you synthesize basically a large body of, uh, of research um, and you do this based on a method which is systematic, explicit, and that somebody can reproduce. So here, here I want to emphasize the word reproducibility of the method because if I do a systematic literature review for a paper and you have another researcher who's doing a systematic literature review on a uh, topic like, for example, uh, social, social entrepreneurship, and we use the same method, then basically the outcome should be more or less exactly the same. If I can compare this or contrast this with doing a literature review for a conceptual or an empirical paper, suppose you take the case and I ask two PhD students to do a literature review on social entrepreneurship, um, on the field of social entrepreneurship and develop a research question, then chances are relatively high that they will draw on different, uh, different, uh, different papers. They will not use exactly the same set of papers to do the literature review. And then as an outcome, they will probably come up with different uh, perspectives. They will probably come up with different research questions. For example, one of the students could focus more on the paradox literature for, uh, in the field of entrepreneurship and then uh, develops a research question on addressing the tensions in social enterprises, whereas the other student may draw on business model and scaling literature in social entrepreneurship and look at the performance implications uh, of that. So in contrast, when you're using a systematic literature review, then the outcome should be and will be exactly the same. This is really important that we, um, that we all keep this in the back of our, um, of our heads. Now, what are some important characteristics of a systematic literature review. In my view, there are three of them. Uh, the first is that systematic literature reviews basically address an um, generalizability of claims much more broadly than in an empirical, uh, an empirical study because an SLR integrates insights from dozens of different empirical studies. Whereas if you're doing, for example, a quantitative uh, paper, Potentially, you will, you will receive the, um, the advice to select a specific context, because here we want to rule out in an empirical study, if we want to test hypothesis, relationships between independent and dependent variables, it's better to focus on one specific uh, context, one specific environment, because you want to rule out alternative, ex uh, alternative explanations, which may come from uh, sampling um, cases from different, uh, from different contexts. Secondly, a systematic literature review also focuses typically on a very broad set of patterns and connections among a variety of empirical, uh, of empirical findings. Again, if you contrast this with empirical work, then I'm sure you, re you receive the advice that when you're doing a quantitative paper, it's always better to focus on a very specific aspect, on a very specific set of independent variables that have some, com some common denominator, because this will allow you to make a much clearer contribution to the literature and to the audience you want to have a conversation with in the literature. And this, of course, will uh, increase your chances for 
um, getting your work uh, published. In an SLR, it's just the opposite. There you try to broaden the scope as much as possible to give a very broad overview of what is the stock of knowledge we have on a certain topic or on a certain research question to date and how can we move forward. So as I will show in the illustration later on this, uh, this, uh, this session, in the paper that we published, we adopted what's called an uh, antecedents process and outcome uh, model. So there we look at what are antecedents of entry modes, what are processes involved in entry modes and what are outcomes that result from choosing different type of entry modes. Clearly, if you want to collapse all of these different elements in one empirical paper, chances for getting published are relatively low. So this is an, uh, a second difference. And then a third thing is that in a systematic literature review, you will typically, since you select dozens of different papers that all speak to a specific topic or a specific field, you will involve methodological diversity in your analysis and in your synthesis across all these different papers. Again, making the contrast to empirical work, I realize and I'm aware of the fact that there are more and more mixed method papers, uh, empirical papers that get uh, published. However, based on my personal experience, it's very, very difficult to do this. And it's even more difficult to publish this because I'm sure you heard in the different sessions before on qualitative research and quantitative research that the level of rigor which is expected in top journals from a quantitative perspective but also from a qualitative perspective are so high that it's extremely difficult to integrate these two different methodological approaches, quant and qual, in one single, um, one single empirical paper. Converse, in contrast, in an SLR, you will include as many papers as possible that use multiple uh, methodological um, approaches. Moving on to the, next, uh, to the next slides, this slide here provides you a little bit an overview or the landscape of um, systematic literature reviews. So what different type of literature reviews um, exist? In essence, there are two, two different parameters that you have to take into account. The first one is differentiating between topic-guided literature reviews, which are quite general and typically quite broad in terms of uh, approach. And then you have research-guided uh, literature reviews, which are typically a little bit more narrow and a little bit more um, focused. Now, I appreciate that this sounds a little bit abstract, so let, let me try to refine this and explain this in a little bit um, in, a, in a little bit more detail by pointing to two, to two different studies that approach on the one hand a topic guided literature review and the other one uses a research question literature review. Um, for the research question guided literature review, as an example, I can refer to the work by uh, Kobis um, and colleagues and they published a paper in Journal of Management uh, recently. And they focus on the consequences of participating in the sharing economy. And they specifically focus in their um, review on the role of trusts in this relationship between consequence on the one hand and then the outcomes on the, um, on the other hand of participating in the sharing economy. Con in contrast, to illustrate, if you look at the research topic guided uh, literature review, I can refer, for example, to uh, Klotz et al., who also published in Journal of Management, and they have a literature review on new venture teams. And in this literature review, they do not only look at the outcomes of new venture teams, but they also look at what are different type of team processes that have been studied today, what are some of the inputs into uh, teams and team dynamics. And here you see that they have a much broader scope than just consequences only or one variable of interest like trust um, only. As I will try to explain in the um, illustration later on, also the review that we published is a topic guided literature review. It's namely on entry modes in the context of um, small and medium sized uh, companies. So this is one, one dimension, topic versus research question. The second dimension is a narrative literature review versus an uh, meta-analysis based um, literature review. Um, 
A narrative literature review basically is a systematic analysis and synthesis primarily focusing on the content of existing research on a certain topic or a certain, uh, certain research question. A meta-analysis, on the other hand, is a statistical analysis, a statistical analysis of a very large set of results from individual studies that have been published to date on a certain topic. For the narrative literature review, I will use my own paper as an illustration. For the meta-analysis, I will use the illustration of a paper published in Journal of Business Venturing by uh, Brinkman and uh, colleagues, and they published a paper, a meta-analysis literature review on um, titled Should Entrepreneurs Plan or Storm the Castle? Basically, they, they, they frame their literature review and the tension or the debate in the literature, in the entrepreneurship literature, whether planning matters. Yeah, because on the one hand, you have this school of thought on, 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 on planning. And then in an opposite, you have the, the school of thought on learning. You think about the recent ideas on the Lean Startup Method, etc. And they basically say that or argue that planning is a little bit a waste of uh, time and that you should basically storm the castle and uh, start developing your company as you're moving, uh, moving forward. Um, so what is the, so the general approach is, does it really matter? And then in a meta-analysis, you will typically see that they will use a moderating uh, model because they want to provide a more nuanced perspective on the, on the association between the independent and the dependent variable. In their case, it's business planning and performance, as you can see on the, uh, as you can see on the slide. What they did in their study is they integrated um, they integrated insights and statistical results from 47 published studies on the planning performance relationship and then introduced as a novelty the moderating factors to examine under which circumstances this relationship is stronger or weaker. To be honest, I, don't, I never performed the meta-analysis myself, but I included the reference here of Lipsy and uh, Wilson 2001. Um, because this is a book dedicated to the meta-analysis methodology, the statistical method of integrating insights, statistical insights from a large set of studies in order to generate more uh, novel, uh, novel insights. Then we come to the, um, then we come to the process. What you see here is an, um, is a, is, a, is a very straightforward presentation of how to conduct a systematic literature review. It looks quite mechanical, and, and I hope you will, you will agree with me at the end of this session that conducting a systematic literature review is not very difficult. It doesn't, it doesn't require a lot of, um, a lot of um, creativity, to be honest. But the most important thing is that you use a very strict, well-articulated and well-developed methods to select, to choose the search terms, and then to apply the screening criteria. Um, I, will, I will walk you through each of these different uh, steps, things like a six-step uh, process, through the, paper that I, um, through the paper that I published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so here you see the title of the paper. Um, the ID for the paper goes already back uh, on, uh, a little bit longer than 2016, as you can imagine. I think we started to work on this project in 2012, um, 2013. And um, together with my co-author, co uh, Robin, we were able to publish this in Journal of Small Business Management, which is an, uh, an, entrepreneurship, um, an entrepreneurship journal. Uh, so I will walk you through each of these diff different steps and illustrate through the, through the paper how, how each step uh, works and um, functions. So the first step, of course, um, which is often the most difficult one, it's, it's introducing the research topic and providing a very clear justification and argumentation why we actually need this review. Yeah? 
Um, so at the end of the day, in, the, in your introduction, you, you want to get the attention from the, um, from the reader. And having a strong argumentation, building on different uh, arguments, help to not only get published, of course, but also help to get the attention from, the, um, from your audience. So what, how did we approach this in this paper here? Is that building on IB, and I'm sure Philippe is much more an expert than uh, myself, uh, building on IB, um, we argue that entry mode choice is uh, very important. Uh, subsequently, we also indicate that um, entry modes are important for SMEs and that SMEs are different from uh, multinational enterprises. We then also explicitly point out and acknowledge that there are already existing SLRs uh, on uh, multinational enterprise entry modes but to date, there is no specific SLR on uh, SMEs. And this is a point I want to emphasize, is that it's always important that you point out in the introduction of your SLR paper that there is already existing uh, literature reviews on the uh, topic, but then you clearly differentiate and you clearly explain how your SLR complements or extend the insights generated by these existing uh, SLRs. You, you, you need to be explicit um, explicit on this. It doesn't make any sense to hide that somebody else already did some kind of uh, SLR because I'm sure that the editor, and if not the editor, your reviewers will uh, will find these existing, uh, existing studies. Um, and then you basically need to make the argument that, okay, since there are no existing SLRs on this topic, there has already been some research, there has been accumulation of studies in this domain now it's time to take what I take stock uh, before moving forward uh, and basically develop an, um, a research agen agenda for future research on SME entry modes. Um, also important in your introduction is that you clearly emphasize what the, um, what the methodological approaches that you will use, what kind of um, analytical frameworks will you use to, to synthesize the existing body of research on the, on the topic, in our case, SME entry modes. What we did here in the study is we focused, uh, we used the uh, APU model, which is uh, antecedents, processes, and uh, outcomes. And in your introduction, of course, you, you stated clear that you're gonna develop an agenda for future research. And you also already give a couple of pointers of what are some of the uh, most compelling uh, directions that you, uh, that you develop in greater detail in the paper. So this is the step one, which is the, the justification of the, um, of the research topic. The steps two to four of the systematic literature review basically all uh, speak to the methods. Um, it's, as I mentioned earlier, doing, being very clear on this, being very transparent is a fundamental element, a fundamental characteristic of your SLR. If you're not clear on how you set the boundaries of your study, how you selected the articles through the keywords, how you went from the initial set of articles all the way down to the articles that are finally retained and included in the analysis, you will automatically receive an, uh, a reject of your SLR paper because it's not reproducible. So people need to be able to reproduce the study based on how you, how well you explain your uh, methods here. So translating this into practice based on the study that we, um, that we did uh, with Robin, um, we set the boundaries by uh, only including uh, journal articles. And this is also a tip I want to share with the, uh, with the, with the, um, the audience is that to the extent possible, always try to justify and embed your choices regarding to methods in existing, existing uh, work or existing papers that used also a systematic literature review approach, of course, in a different topic or, or, or in a different context, but it always helps if you can establish or if you can embed your choices in published work. Uh, so for example, we built on Brothers and Hennert 2007, we built on um, the literature review by the Clerk um, et al. 
by only focusing on five specific categories of um, journals. Then also in the method section and the paper, you would see that we list all the different keywords that we used to identify the initial set of um, articles. And then a vital part is also the, um, the explanation of the screening process. So in every SLR, you will always see that the set of articles that is eventually retained for analysis is typically not the, the initial set that they started from after using the keywords to identify all the different papers. So in our paper here, we used um, a three-step screening process. So after applying the different keywords, we initially got an, a set of articles of over 900, as you can see, 901. But then we did two, two additional screening steps in order to refine the uh, set of articles that we want to um, use for the, um, for the literature review. And the first, the first screening uh, set of criteria we used is we manually went through all of these 901 uh, papers and we tried to sort it out whether SMEs were really the main subject or a core focus in the, uh, in the article or whether the SMEs were included in the, uh, in the data collection. And then the second, in the second screening, um, we uh, only retained those papers that were on internationalization and on SMEs and only focused on entry modes. For this, an, uh, a tip I can give here uh, to the students is that you typically want to do this with multiple researchers. Right? So for each of these two different screening uh, steps, going from 901 to 245 and then from 245 to 47, every, uh, every time we had two different researchers screening the papers. And if there was a disagreement between the two, then a third researcher was involved to come to an, uh, to come to an, um, an agreement. Again, and I will probably um, rehearse or <laughs> repeat some of the, the things um, throughout my talk. This needs to be very clearly outlined and discussed in your papers so that somebody can redo the exercise again. So based on this whole screening, um, screening exercise, we, um, we then share the outcome of that in, an, uh, in a table which looks like this. I know it's a little bit, uh, uh, small to read, but here you, you want to establish um, uh, transparency by indicating the list of journals that you selected, as you can see here with the five uh, different categories, and then also how many papers you, re you retained or you uh, included in your uh, final, um, final analysis. And as you can see, at the end of the uh, screening process, we retained 47 of them. Then the fifth step is the review, um, is the review step. Um, and here again, it's, an, it's a method-based approach. So here again, we, we outline in the paper how we coded uh, and how we analyzed the content of each of the 47 papers included in the analysis. Again, all the choices and all the elements that we uh, focused on in our um, literature review is based on prior prior work. So, for example, we focus, we used insights from the Clerk et al. Uh, we used insights from Brothers and Hennert et al. in order to analyze these papers in an uh, in a sound methodological um, approach. So, for the papers here in this uh, in this literature review, we uh, we coded uh, each paper on the stage of entry. So does the paper speak about like, antecedents, processes, or uh, outcomes of entry mode? We also coded what type of theoretical perspective was used. Uh, for example, was it transaction cost economics? Or was it more in a resource-based view of the firm uh, approach? We also coded the methodology used. Was it qualitative, quantitative, conceptual? Um, what type of uh, SMEs are studied here? What is the sample? What is the home country? What type of uh, data? Um, what is the nature of the data collection, uh, etc.? 
and then we also, for each of the different papers, we also uh, coded the, uh, the findings in a qualitative way by pointing out to the supported and unsupported predictions. Again, as, an, uh, as a researcher trying to publish in a uh, systematic literature review, you need to summarize all of this information in tables. And this is an, an, an example of one of the tables that we included in the, um, in the uh, final publication. And so just to point out to one of the uh, articles, you can see one of the articles was written, the first one by Iramili and Rao. Uh, the, the theoretical framework was transaction cost economics. The focus of the paper was primarily on um, choice. Uh, the sample were uh, service firms and almost one third of the companies were SMEs. The home country was the United States, cross-sectional data, data set 114 firms. And then we also, in, then we also point to what are some of the supported uh, predictions and what are some of the uh, unsupported uh, predictions. If you would go to the, uh, to the paper, then you would see that this table on all 47 articles is extremely long. But this is again to establish transparency with the um, with the editor, with the reviewers, and also eventually with the um, audience after it's getting uh, published, so that people can see how we coded each of these single uh, articles. So this is all, as you can see, all quite uh, mechanical. As long as you have a very good protocol for selecting, a very good protocol for uh, coding. Every can, everybody can repeat more or less this, uh, this exercise. And then of course you need to synthesize. So you need to bring together the insights from all these different uh, papers in an overarching uh, analytical uh, framework. And as mentioned earlier in the research topic and in the justification, here we, um, we chose to go for an uh, an antecedents process and outcome model, which is very similar to what the Clark et al. did in their JBV uh, SLR on uh, international uh, entrepreneurship. And then we were also uh, transparent in how we coded uh, and how we decided whether to include certain elements for antecedents processes and outcomes by using the methods uh, proposed by Koip and uh, Gassman, 2009, which is also a paper in Journal of Management. Uh, and here in this paper, they retained concepts in their analytical framework on the condition if they, if they appear at least two times in one of the, um, one of the papers included in the, uh, in the final literature review. Uh, and this is basically then how we came up with this specific analytical uh, analytical model. And then of course, then you need to have a little bit of uh, creativity. In my personal opinion, you do not need to have a great level of uh, uh, creativity, but still. Because then of course you need to develop the research agenda. And you need to develop the research agenda and here, of course, you need to be, um, you need to be uh, uh, smart by embedding all the research, the, the suggestions for future research. You need to embed them in the findings of your um, uh, content analysis and also of your uh, synthesis, the first part of your synthesis, in the sense that you, you, you don't want to give the impression that these research suggestions for future research are the result of a brainstorming exercise together with your co-authors, but you need to be uh, very clear how each of these ideas relates to the insights that were generated from the systematic literature review uh, exercise. And just to give you a couple of ideas of what we included. So we organized our future research agenda in four parts. So we first talked about um, some considerations related to the methodology. Remember that we coded all the uh, papers, what type of methods uh, they use, sample, type of data collection, uh, type of statistical analysis. And for example, we, we make a call for, long, for more longitudinal uh, studies. And then secondly, we developed a research agenda based on our analytical uh, approach, eh, which was the antecedents, processes, and uh, outcome model. For example, for the antecedents, 
our review showed that there was not a lot of existing research on the role of the entrepreneur. Um, and arguably the entrepreneur makes an important, has an important impact on the type of um, entry mode that the company will use to uh, enter, foreign, uh, enter foreign markets or serve foreign markets. Uh, then we also uh, proposed fresh perspectives on uh, processes. For example, we uh, introduced the idea to build on the behavioral theory of the firm and more specifically the, um, the concept of performance feedback and how performance feedback may influence or may function as a trigger to change the existing uh, entry modes used by the uh, by the company and then finally we also uh, based on our um, literature review we we pointed out that there was a clear lack of research on performance implications of entry mode um, choice so what is important here in your final step is that you for each of the future research agenda elements that you always tie this very uh, closely to the insights generated by the review uh, by the review itself. So I hope this clarifies a little bit more how the process works from from selecting the research topic all the way down to um, to developing the um, the research agenda. And as you can see, it's um, in in my personal experience, it's it's much more difficult to develop. Uh, hypothesis, et cetera, and, and, and to develop an, uh, a very clear argument for an, uh, for an empirical paper than doing a uh, systematic literature review because it's, it's relatively mechanical in how you have to, uh, and how you have to approach this. As long as you are very clear on what your method is, as long as you are very clear on how you selected the papers, on how you coded the papers, and on how you uh, synthesize them, then the, the research ag agenda automatically flows from that, uh, from that analysis. Still, of course, I want to finalize the first part of my talk here by um, pointing out to a couple of um, things you want to keep in the back of your heads if you want to publish your, um, or if you want to start working on a systematic, systematic literature review. An open door, of course, is that there always needs to be a fit with the uh, fit with the journal. It sounds very obvious, but still, from my personal experience, I um, I have the impression that uh, early stage researchers do not always take a very careful look at these uh, at these things. Try to get a very good understanding of what is the ongoing conversation in the journal, and you also need to signal primarily to editors and reviewers that you are really contributing to a conversation that is part of this journal's audience. And if you don't, one of the, one of the editors told me that if, you don't, if, it, if they don't see any connection to journal publications from their specific um, uh, journal, then this uh, signals to some extent that you are not really building on an existing conversation within that, uh, within that journal. Okay? So this is a first important uh, but obvious, uh, obvious uh, point. Then, of course, a challenge is identifying the space for the review. Um, in essence, there are two different approaches. Either you want to focus a very narrow review on a mature topic that may need some kind of reconceptualization. Reconce Based on my personal understanding of uh, the field, this is, an, um, this is a minority in terms of systematic literature reviews, most of them are broad reviews of emerging topics in need of an initial uh, synthesis. A very a practical piece of advice here is that before you start to work on your systematic literature review, make sure that you do a good search for existing reviews in, um, in top journals. And you don't need to panic if you find that there are, that there are already literature reviews out there published on a topic that speaks to some extent to what you have in mind, but then you need to make sure that you're explicit in your introduction. And this gives you basically the opportunity to differentiate your systematic literature review from the existing ones and build a strong argumentation why there is a need for your, uh, for your literature review on, your, on this specific topic with this specific method you have in, um, you have in mind. A second set of... Um, 
pointers here is the um, is that the literature review should be quote up to date. If, a, if an editor receives a systematic literature review and the most recent paper is 10 years old, then the chances of getting uh, through the through the desk reject are pro probably uh, probably uh, uh, low. Crucial is that you're clear on the methodological uh, approach that you use. And so be very explicit in every single step of the, uh, of the methods, both in terms of selection and in terms of uh, how you analyzed um, the papers. Also an important thing that editors look at is that the synthesis has to be critical. You need to show uh, integration and synthesis, synthesis skills. And based on what I heard from, a review, from an editor is that how do they make the difference? Is that they, if they see that paragraphs in your synthesis section where you integrate the insight, if your paragraph starts with author A says this and then author B says uh, something else, then this signals that you didn't really integrate these insights. So it's better not not to you not to start sentences with the uh, authors, but just integrate insights and then use the um, references at the end of your um, at the end of your sentence. And then, of course, uh, to give you a rule of thumb, uh, a significant part of your paper should be contributed to developing the research uh, agenda. If you only have one or two avenues for future research, then your chances for um, getting published are probably relatively low. A rule of thumb I found in, uh, in a paper recently is that uh, one fourth is very mechanical, but this speaks a little bit to the systematic literature review as a whole little bit mechanical that a significant part, 20 to 25% of the paper should talk about future research um, ideas. So this is, um, this is where I want to stop the first, uh, the first part, because then the second part is the, uh, the work in progress uh, paper, which, uh, which I want to keep for after some Q&A, or if some students want to share something, uh, some of their ideas or I don't know. I give the floor to Alex. Thanks, Johan. Um, thanks for a very informative first part. Very well structured, pretty much like any systematic literature review. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are a few interesting questions. Uh, first one is from Jimmy. Uh, you might have answered answered it partly, but still, I think it's a, it's a good question uh, mm -hmm. about is a systematic literature review as a methodology, the same as one, a meta-analysis, or two, a review of reviews, where he means a review of literatures. Sorry, can you repeat, or is it here in the chat? Okay, the, first, the very first question, if you open the chat, is yeah. a systematic literature review the same as a meta-analysis, or no. a review of reviews? No, no. Based, on, based, on my, based on my understanding, and systematic literature review looks more at the contents of, um, of papers uh, and includes uh, qualitative work, uh, conceptual papers, and uh, quantitative work on a, on a certain topic, like in, uh, in the paper that we did on the entry mode. A meta-analysis is basically an analysis of existing analysis. So it's a statistical, uh, statistical method, like in the case of the uh, Brinkman uh, paper, if I can show the paper again. Um, here you see the model. So they basically do an, an analysis of the results of, a, of published empirical papers on that specific topic. So if you would look at the paper, then you would see that this, this includes results of um, statistical analysis, which is not the case in the... Um, uh, which is not the case in a uh, systematic literature review, which is more content uh, content oriented. Mm. And a review of reviews, that's a, uh, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting point. What I've seen um, in systematic literature reviews that I read um, so uh, so far is that what people often do or sometimes do is they, they provide an overview of existing reviews on the topic in which they want to position their own uh, systematic literature review. 
by pointing out what are the existing understanding uh, and the existing approach of these reviews. And this basically allows them to establish a very clear argumentation of why there is a need for their specific literature review. Because they are able to point to the strengths, but they are also able to point to some of the lacking elements in the existing reviews to date on that specific uh, topic or question. Uh, mm -hmm. If the student wants, I can send an example. It was in a literature review on social entrepreneurship. And they first, before they did their own systematic literature review, they made a table of the nine or 10 existing reviews on social entrepreneurship uh, research by clearly uh, outlining how their review is complementary to what this has already been done before by other people in terms of mm -hmm. review. Okay, please, please send it or share it with him. Sorry? Yes, sir, please do share it and we can share it with him. Yes, so if you drop me an email, I can send you this, uh, this, li this literature review. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, then we had a question from Philip. Uh, if you can use a systematic literature review to inform your own research or is it more detached or, uh, or separate? Second question. Uh, good question. Um, I think systematic literature review serves both purposes. So, um, especially for a PhD, I'm, I'm just going to give you my impressions from my own experience. Yeah? So, if I if I develop if I develop an um, an, uh, an argumentation for an empirical paper. I'll be honest, I'm not going to do a systematic literature review by going through a very um, well-defined uh, methodology as I explained in this uh, entry mode paper. I think an SLR has a very high value for different, for in different, different circumstances. For example, if you're a PhD student, then of course you need to develop multiple projects within your PhD. You want to develop a uh, portfolio of uh, projects. To be able to develop this portfolio of projects, you need to have a very broad understanding of the specific literature you want to contribute to or the specific field you want to contribute to. My advice here to PhD students then is that you need to do a broad review anyway. So why not do it in a very systematic way? Because then you, it will not only allow you to inform you about what are some clear gaps that we can identify based on a systematic analysis of the current uh, stock of knowledge we have on a certain topic, but at the same time, it's also an, um, an, an article in itself that can be published. As I mentioned earlier, based on the PhD committees I've been uh, part of, if I look at the, the literature reviews that they do, almost per definition, it's not based on a systematic methodological approach, which means that in order to publish this, it's very, very difficult and redoing the exercise after finishing the PhD probably doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So that's one context where I think an SLR is very interesting. The second context where I think an SLR is interesting is, for example, when you're in a postdoc period or when you're as a, when you're as a researcher running out of steam a little bit, let's say, in like uh, you have four or five papers in the pipeline and you want to develop a new a large project, for example, to attract a grant or something or whatever. Then again, this is a point in your career where doing a very broad literature review makes sense to invest your times and efforts in. And this also allows you to have a publish uh, an, an, a work that has a publication, uh, publication potential. So uh, I think these are two contexts where I think that SLRs are very, very useful to do. Because don't get me wrong, I don't want to give the impression here that this is not time intensive. Eh? It takes a lot of time uh, to code all the articles, to go through them manually uh, one by one. Because if I can already give a pointer about the second paper that we uh, that I'm going to um, present, we started from an initial set of 701 articles. We retained 596 of them, but this took weeks and weeks to clean this data set. Eh? It's not that this is an easy, uh, an easy task that only takes a couple of days. Eh? And 
based on my personal experience in our day-to-day -day activities as a researcher you and you have current projects uh, going on it's not uh, very uh, efficient to uh, to work on these SLRs in parallel eh? mm. opinion eh? okay <laughs> all right uh, oh more questions um, Peter has a lot um, let's see the first one is in a meta synthesis in qualitative studies equivalent to a meta analysis in quantitative studies. I wouldn't know. <laughs> what is the question? I don't see the question in the uh, thread. Uh, uh, it's number three in the chat. Yeah, okay. This, I have to be honest, I won't be able to give an, uh, to give an answer here because I didn't came across meta, um, meta analysis literature reviews that are based on uh, qualitative uh, studies. So if Peter wants, he can send me an email and then I can, then I can uh, look it up in greater, uh, in greater detail uh, to be able to give a more, um, uh, a better, uh, a more correct uh, answer to this specific, uh, specific question. Yes, and I think maybe what he's asking as a follow-up is also interested in saying, well, basically with social entrepreneurship being, you know, still a red relatively young field, um, is doing a systematic literature review a bit of a risk in terms of, you know, basically you, you're covering so little? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I didn't. I didn't perform a, a literature review on social entrepreneurship myself, but I know there already exists a couple of uh, literature reviews on social entrepreneurship, uh, social yeah. entrepreneurship research. So apparently, these people didn't think that this field was too nascent to be able to perform an, uh, a literature mm -hmm. review. And I know that there is an, uh, a recent. Um, a recent publication in Journal of Business Ethics on um, social entrepreneurship uh, research, and mm -hmm. I, they identified hundreds of papers already published in this uh, in this domain. Okay. So, um, but I do agree, of course, if there are only three or four papers in the field so far, then doing a literature review is probably problematic. Um, but still, research domains are, are growing so fast that. Uh, that social entrepreneurship research is already more than established uh, to justify a literature review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also keeping in mind how interdisciplinary this field is, you have to look, you know, to, to your right and to your left a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. that will also broaden sort of the, the, the pool of papers you're looking at mm -hmm. as well. But Building up on your comment, uh, Alex, um, I, I also have a couple of slides on an alternative way of doing a literature review uh, to systematic, and it's called a problematizing literature review. And what, and what you do there is you do not really take a stock of knowledge in a mechanical way as with a systematic literature review of an existing field, rather you focus on a uh, core set of papers published in this domain, like five or 10 studies that you think, that you think as a researcher eh, are representative for that field. And mm -hmm. then you try to enrich the discussion, the ongoing discussion within the specific field by bringing in ideas from other adjacent research fields. Eh? Uh, and this is called the problematizing uh, literature review. I have mm -hmm. a slides on that uh, later on in the uh, session, but I think you you will agree with me that this approach is 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 much more complex and much more difficult compared to the uh, to the SL. Yeah. Uh, because it, there are, it's it's less mechanical as I would uh, as I would uh, describe it. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna change person who's asking questions. We can go back to Peter. He had a few more. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, from Marco, what happens if you do all the steps for the systematic review, and there are a few other papers 
that you know about that for some reason did not show up in the results, but you know are important to the topic you are discussing? Can you add them post fact or should you keep redoing the search terms until all the papers you know about come up? Of course, and so, so although I describe it as mechanical uh, and very sequential, you start with an initial set of, of keywords. If you come to the conclusion, then you may want to revise your keywords and maybe you overlook certain keywords in, at the beginning of your, um, of your process. Of course, the keywords should be guided by, um, by, existing, uh, by existing literature. That's one approach. An alternative approach is that you say, okay, apparently there is not a lot of research on this uh, particular uh, topic. And then you can use this more problematizing uh, approach, which is fundamentally different from the uh, systematic literature review one. Uh, but always, if you, if you, if you do the, the, if you set up the project um, well, then your first step is always trying to see whether it makes sense to do a systematic literature review. Is this a broad mature field? Is this a narrow mature field where there is a need for a reconceptualization? Re or is this an emerging growing field where there is a lack of synthesis and where we need to take a pause, do a stock of the inventory of studies to date in order to be able to provide some future research areas? You first need to do this step. And I know this step is not very straightforward, but you first have to do this step to justify your need for an SLRA. Yeah. Okay. I think um, Mohammed had a live question as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Johan, for the uh, presentation. It's, uh, it's a very informative. So to our involvement in, uh, in uh, systematic literature review these days, and the, we reached it uh, to the point that we're going to read now. So it, we did all the inclusion and exclusion criteria and so Okay. The, uh, the first question is related, do you use any softwares for, uh, uh, for reading? So to, for instance, we're suggesting Atlas. So this is, uh, to, this is uh, the first question. The second question, how do we, you know that literature review, it has like usually more than two, at least like three or so. So how to combine the, uh, the readings and you know, how to start writing between the three, the three of them, especially if uh, there's no, at least for our knowledge, there is no centralized software that all of us read from. So I'm using my Atlas, Alex using his Atlas and, it, you know, and so on. So combine these to, to, together. So just to be clear, uh, Mohammed, I never used the uh, software uh, to do the, um, to do the, the reading uh, through a software program. I know there exists a published work on a topic, I think it's called topic modeling, where they use the software programs to count how many times a certain context uh, con uh, concept appears across multiple, uh, multiple um, uh, articles, but I have no experience in, uh, in using these type of software, uh, software programs. Uh, so, um, what I what in terms of organizing the work, if I understood this was the second the second question in terms of organizing the work, um, for the for the first paper uh, with my uh, with my colleague, there we basically divided the um, divided the work between uh, between the two of us because you have a relatively clear way of um, uh, coding the uh, coding the articles. Uh, and then we checked each other's work because you, you start from um, some kind of a template and it's basically filling in, uh, filling in a template. For the other, the other study is together with, um, with a colleague where we are using, um, we, where he is using bibliometric uh, software and he is taking care of all the analysis. So all the analysis are centralized uh, with him. Um, and that's how we organize the, uh, organize the work. But I have no experience with topic modeling or uh, using software to analyze the text. Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. I can imagine that this is becoming more and more important because the body of research is growing so fast. Eh? Thank you. Uh, uh. Um, is there time for a couple more questions? I'm not sure how long your second part is. 
Oh, my second part is even longer than the first one, uh, Alex. But I'm happy to take uh, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> but just I just want to make sure that the audience understand that uh, that I'm I'm not the the expert on uh, on SLR. I'm primarily talking from my own uh, from from my own experience uh, doing this, going through the publication process of a uh, systematic literature review. The important thing is that they realize that. There is a recipe, but the recipe, of course, is to some extent dependent on what you want to do with your systematic literature review, how you approach it, uh, how you how you work with your colleagues, etc. Mm -hmm. But there always need to be a recipe. Yeah. This recipe has to be crystal clear in your paper, because based on my experience with the uh, with the uh, reviewers. Um, uh, of course, the justification of why do we need the literature review had to be sharpened. And then we got the advice from the editors to build on existing literature reviews in similar or in adjacent topics so that we can have a stronger argument of why, our, why, why and how our, our review is complementary to what has already been done. Mm. And the, um, the second part, the second big part of the review process was on on clarifying all the different steps we went through, because in the first version, you always, because it's always clear in your head how you made all the choices and all the decisions, but they also have to be crystal, crystal clear on paper. And so we, we, we spend one round of reviews, clarifying this whole recipe um, elements. Mm. Okay. So these were the two core issues because the, these were the two issues that we encountered primarily in the review process because the, re the, the research agenda automatically flows from your analysis. So th there is often not a lot of debate, at least not based on my experience with the uh, publication here. There's not a lot of debate on is this re does this make sense, this research avenue or not? Uh, it's, it mm -hmm. comes from your, uh, from your review work. Mm -hmm. But the first two parts are, uh, are, 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 are important. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I would, I would, uh, is, here is what I'm thinking. I would ask a couple of questions because I think they may clarify some misconceptions. And then with the time remaining, you could maybe, we could jump to, because you, you were going to basically do a practical demonstration of, based on your, on your paper. Or maybe we could jump to uh, like the coding, sense making. Uh, step or stage, because I think perhaps the the keywords and all those initial steps might be clear to everyone. What do you think? What? So I I need to I need to walk back to, again through this. No, 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 no. To the, I was to the saying, next we don't have much time, so I would ask a couple more questions, and then yeah. in your, you said your second part is much longer. So yeah. maybe we can we can uh, focus on the more. Uh, maybe like unintuitive or secret bearing part of your presentation? Or yes. <laughs> yeah. So basically what I want to point out in the second paper is, so this is an, um, this is a, an, an, a, a, a piece of work, which is a, a work in progress that I'm collaborating on with uh, Tiago Ratino, who's a colleague at ISEC, and uh, Inacio Garcia, who is a PhD student of mine at, uh, at KU Leuven. And, the novelty here in this uh, in this SLR, because there have been there, 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 there has recently been a publication on hybrid organization uh, a literature review. I think it was published in two thousand seventeen, but it's it's uh, primarily focusing on an, uh, what I would call a classic SLR, uh, using the recipe and then doing an additive uh, analysis. What we what we introduce here as a novelty in order to justify why why we think this could be published is because we blend bibliometric analysis together with a an, uh, narrative uh, analysis on the one hand, and um, by doing by using a bibliometric analysis, it's a an, uh, statistical uh, approach. Just to clarify, I'm not the expert. It's my co-author Tiago who's an expert on this. But because we use this statistical based uh, approach, we are able to handle, similarly to what Mohammed pointed out, to handle a much broader set of uh, papers. Uh, and also we can go beyond what I would call the status of the, of the field itself. 
Because if you have an, a bibliometric uh, analysis, you cannot only look at what is the status of the fields of research on hybrid organizations, but you can, do, you can also do two additional things, which is on the one hand, you can look at its intellectual foundations because you can analyze the underlying citations of your field of, of the corpus of research on hybrid organizations itself. And then secondly, you can also analyze how did this field of research on hybrid organizations inform other fields of research? So you can look at what is the status of the field itself. You can look at where does the field come from? What are the intellectual foundations of the field? And thirdly, you can also look at the uh, impact um, of the field beyond the research domain of hybrid organizations. And this is what we do in this paper here. Can I walk through the slides? Um, uh, and you see here the, uh, the methods. So the corpus of literature that we identified based on the bibliometric approach is 596 uh, papers. You can see that this is already much broader than the 47 papers that we retained in the previous one. And then the bibliometric analysis of the intellectual foundations of the field itself relates to almost 30,000 corresponding citations. And we also identified from the corpus of the 596 papers, we identified 10,000, uh, almost 10,000 articles that cite this work of this uh, field of research. Yeah. And I think I've never seen a paper, if somebody has a, knows a paper that uses a similar approach, please send it to me because my search didn't reveal such a paper yet. And I think the, the novelty here is that we can look at past, present, and impact in one single literature review. Um, so this is the this was the trigger for um, for doing this uh, for doing this uh, type of analysis. And just to give you an insight of how this uh, bibliometric analysis uh, works, is that you do not have to do the coding yourself. It's basically uh, based on uh, co-citation analysis. And from what my colleague tried to explain to me, because I'm not an expert, co-citation analysis works is based basically on the number of times that two documents are cited together in another paper. And the underlying assumption here is that when two pieces of uh, research are cited together, then they are somehow conceptually connected to each other. Okay? And so you don't have to do the coding yourself anymore. You just base your analysis on your uh, citation, co-citation analysis. And then you can visualize how this field is conceptually organized, how these different papers all link together uh, conceptually based on the underlying, uh, the underlying research on which it is uh, built. I'm sure this all sounds very, uh, uh, exotic for people who have no experience or little experience with bibliometric analysis. But just to give you an idea, this is the type of outcome which is generated from a bibliometric analysis. So based on my own uh, reading of systematic literature reviews, I didn't see a lot of these papers that use bibliometrics in their, um, in their analysis. They all use a more classic uh, narrative, uh, narrative approach. But this is, for example, the outcome of analyzing the body of research, the 597, uh, 900, 596 something uh, papers, and this is this is uh, this is a very interesting uh, picture because what does it show? It shows that when you look at this whole body of research on hybrid organizations and how did we identify it? It's by using a keyword hybrid org. Uh, which generated a list of 700 and something uh, papers. And then we still had to do the manual refinement to 596 to exclude papers that were not on organizations, because I remember we had papers included on chemical processes, et cetera. Apparently hybrid orc also appears in this, uh, in this field of research. But what do you take away from an, from an analysis like this? I hope you appreciate that this is very different from what you typically have in a, narr in a narrative built uh, systematic literature review is that although all these papers talk about hybrid organizations, there is a very clear 
nexus, there's a very clear core of papers, which is represented in the middle of the figure. Uh, can you see my pointer here? Here, this is a core, a core of papers that all that all that are all tightly um, connected to each other. But then, surprisingly, there are a lot of papers that also talk about hybrid organizations that do that is that are not connected to this core of papers that you have here in the middle. And then, in a subsequent analysis, we further analyzed this core of papers, and you see that there are basically within this core there are eleven clusters of work that all have an underlying, uh, that are all cited together in other, um, in other articles. But you see, in contrast to the previous figure, that here all these different papers are connected to each other. So they, although they, they, are all, they are 11 clusters individually, they are connected in the sense that they create one subdomain within this field of hybrid organization uh, research. And, this type of novel of novel analysis or alternative analysis are are um, impossible to do through a narrative uh, narrative approach. And so what my colleague is doing is uh, trying to get a better understanding of how a, a research field is organized based on bibliometrics rather than based on doing individual coding of each of these five hundred and ninety six uh, papers through a narrative. Uh, narrative approach, because as Mohammed will uh, agree, this is an extremely time intensive uh, uh, process. Eh? So this is one type of analysis that my colleague is uh, currently uh, performing. So we did this for the corpus of uh, hybrid organization research itself. We also did it for the foundations of the hybrid organization research field. So this is exactly the same analysis, but not on the field itself but on the intellectual foundations. So this is the analysis of the references that are cited by the field itself. So this is the analysis of what I, what I called earlier the past. If you remember the three different sections, the past, the present, and the impact, this is the analysis of the, um, of the past. And basically it's the same approach. It's also bibliometric based on uh, citation, co-citation analysis. I know I'm sure you're also wondering what the uh, bibliometric analysis is of the uh, impact, but I have to be uh, uh, silent on this because my colleague is still working on this piece of um, on this piece of the uh, of the story. So we only have insights on the foundations. We only have insights on the field itself. For the uh, for the impact, he's still working on that, but we plan to have a. Uh, a full version uh, by the beginning of uh, beginning of 2021 uh, um, and then to complement because i'm looking at the time then to complement this work here on a citation co-citation analysis of the foundations my colleague also did a spectroscopy analysis i'm not sure if somebody is familiar with that maybe philip are you familiar with the spectroscopy analysis spectroscopy analysis basically allows to identify which years have been more impactful in influencing the research field of hybrid organizations compared to the average across the whole time periods. And this is indicated by the peaks. You see the peaks here on this, on this document, on this graph, where is it? You see the peaks here, like 1991, there's a peak, 2010, there was a peak, 2006, there was a peak. These are years where you have publications that have been, relatively speaking, more influ influential on the domain of hybrid organizations compared to the average cited reference from the intellectual foundations of this, uh, of this domain. And so by combining uh, narrative analysis, because this is also part of our, of our paper, but with uh, bibliometric analysis like citation, co-citation, and spectroscopy analysis, you can add another layer of insights to your systematic literature review. Because this type of, this type of analysis through a narrative approach are, uh, are impossible to do. Eh? You're not going to analyze 29,000 underlying uh, citations eh? uh, in, an, um, in a narrative way. Um, and so this is, the, this is the working paper that we currently, um, that you currently have. On, um, on this bibliometric uh, approach. If somebody is interested to see the working paper version 
early January 21, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to send it because then you can have a much better insight, and in especially the bibliometric uh, approach because that it's well uh, well explained and much better than I'm explaining uh, right now. But the outcome is exactly the same in the sense that the results speak immediately to the future research areas you can develop in your literature review. For example, based on the spectroscopy analysis and based on this bibliom bibliometric analysis of the field of the foundations of the hybrid organization research field, you automatically see that the research draws primarily on institutional transaction cost economics identity and paradox theories, because these are the four clusters of theories that you see here in this slide. You see the different colors. There should be four. I'm colorblind, so if you tell me there are five, I will have to believe you there are five. But my colleague tell me that there are four. Uh, and so these four different colors speak to these four different institution, uh, theoretical perspectives, institutional theory, transaction cost, identity theory, and paradox theory. And what we also identified through the spectroscopy analysis is that over time, by looking at these peaks, over time, the hybrid organization research fields becomes more and more inward looking. Why? Because they are more and more and more drawing on earlier work from within the field itself. And so if you look at the peaks, especially the closer peaks, 2010, 2006, these oversighted papers from a relative perspective, these oversighted papers come from the field itself. And so we see that as the field is moving forward, they are drawing more and more on insights generated by earlier papers from within the field. Of course, on the one hand, this signals that the field is maturing okay, because you're drawing on existing insights from earlier papers from within the field itself. On the other hand, of course, okay, you could be evil-minded and say, okay, the field is more and more becoming uh, inward looking and, and, and rehearsing some of the original ideas that were uh, proposed by earlier uh, earlier work in this uh, in this domain, and so the future research areas we develop for this specific finding flow automatically from the insights generated by the bibliometric analysis that we have. By stating that eh, that uh, future research eh, there may be a need for some external perspectives to generate some fresh uh, insights, and at the same time, since it's been dominated by these different uh, theories including these new fresh perspectives may lead to multiple theories used in single, uh, in single studies or in uh, individual uh, studies. And so you see that conceptually, there is not a lot of difference between developing this, this systematic literature review and the other systematic literature review. The key differentiator here is the use of the bibliometric analysis because the body of research that we are looking at is much bigger than in the uh, than in the other version of the uh, than in the other paper, forty seven versus thirty thousand five hundred and ninety six and ten thousand uh, articles, and then a narrative approach is extremely difficult. So I think I will, I, I think I'll conclude my uh, discussion here because I thought the session ends at uh, at uh, four thirty my time, which is five thirty your time, I guess. Uh, so, but I just wanted to share this with the uh, with the audience that bibliometrics are also, in our opinion, based on based on our uh, insights, a powerful tool to uh, to do systematic literature reviews. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, I think we've uh, we've learned a lot today, and including myself, I've heard some terminologies I've never heard before. Um, maybe there is time for one or two questions there were a couple that i overlooked um but pretty much we've uh, we're very happy with what we learned today so one question was about can i just ask you one question myself alex you you said that yeah. you learned some new terminology that you never heard before <laughs> yeah what, what do you call the problematic the problematic literature review i've never heard uh, of the, the the problematizing Okay, but I, I will send you my slides uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, the problematizing uh, literature review. Problematizing. There you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah, here it's an. Um, there was a, a recent special issue in Journal of Management Studies on uh, literature reviews, 
and there was a point counterpoint uh, between two uh, two scholars. One was in uh, in the camp of the um, systematic literature review, which is of course very well known eh, and a well established uh, approach. And then this, uh, these researchers, and I'll give you the name of the, um, of the, of the authors, say you have Alv Alveson and uh, Sandberg, 2020, and they present a completely different way of performing an, a literature review by not using this full store inventory in approach, as you can see here on the slide. Eh? So you're not gonna develop the recipe, be crystal clear on the recipe and then Execute it uh, as if you would be a, uh, a cook, eh? as if you would uh, uh, very um, uh, in practice. But you use a, a much more uh, flexible approach in identifying those pieces of work that you think, as a researcher, are interesting to develop your uh, to develop your uh, your story and your paper. Mm. As you can imagine. Alex, you see, you see here the three-step approach that they develop in their paper. And so if you look up the paper, you will see how, it, how they present it that you could potentially use. But here, the, 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 the potential impact of researcher bias is very, is very high, of course. And if you compare mm -hmm. the systematic literature review, this method is yeah. focused on eliminating researcher bias as much as possible, because it has to be re you have to be able to repro reproduce it based on the recipe written in the, uh, in, the, in, in the paper. Here, you start from core readings in the review domain, and there you can have some indicators, like for example, you take the most cited papers within a certain research domain, because the, then yeah. the question is that they have, they generated most interest, most conversation. But then if you look at the second, at the second step, you then broaden your research, you, you broaden your review, by including a couple of readings, there's a there's a, a team missing there, a couple of readings in the neighborhood of that domain. But then of course you can see that potential researcher bias comes into the picture here already, because I could have a different um, idea about what is a neighboring domain of research compared to what you have in mind. Let alone that you then open the scope completely. You open the scope completely by introducing other work from the broader social science uh, domain to be able to 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 bring a fresh perspective or a fresh uh, a fresh view on the uh, on the research domain that you departed from in your first step. So, my advice here to especially to to, to early stage researchers would be to first try to familiarize yourself with the SLN methods because it's much more straightforward. Personally, I think that a method like this, you need to have a very good knowledge of the research field already. You need to have a little bit more uh, gray hair from an academic, um, an academic perspective to be able to do such a uh, problematizing uh, review. I guess. Yes, thank you. Um... But I'll send you my slides, eh? so you have the you have the slides, and you can maybe share them also with the. Um, with yes, the yes, that we we usually do. Please share the slides. Um, I've shared your email address. <clears throat> Excuse your email address, since you mentioned a few things that um, they could request. But what I would propose is, uh, we've we've hit the the ninetieth minute of this webinar, and we usually like to finish on time. And okay, still, cool. I'm a, uh, some questions going so maybe um some of the more pressing uh, prickly questions could be could be asked to you um in private especially uh, i see a few people that have very very uh, niche specific questions maybe of problems that come up again that, what i would suggest to uh, alex uh, yeah. to make this efficient for everybody is that if there are people who have specific questions they want to follow up is that they just send me an email and mm. necessarily, I can have a, a quick, uh, a quick uh, call through Zoom or something with them yeah. about their specific project or to to yeah continue the conversation of today's uh, session. And that's okay. okay. Thank you very much. No, that makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah. I think we'll be very grateful for that. So okay. yeah, I think this, is the, this could be the end of our webinar today. Uh, Johan, thank you very much for all the insights and really taking us very uh, systematically through the systematic literature review 
and uh, and how to get it published. I I thank everyone for for being here. I've been seeing throughout the webinars of not even, uh, all these very loyal answers members that were here uh, attending all our different webinars, and I also thank uh, different uh, guests if you if you wish. We can call them guests who have been with us as well. So I wish everyone a most uh, restful uh, holiday period. Please take a break. Please be safe and look after yourselves and your families. And stay tuned for for an exciting 2021 with uh, at Ansys. We'll uh, we'll be in touch, uh, communicating what what the plan is for 2021. And we'll um, yeah, we'll definitely have a a good, uh, good uh, program for 2021 as well. So yes, enjoy your evening or your mornings, depending where you are and uh, see you next time.